2015 is drawing to a close, and if you're like me and you're in the media business, then this time of year means only one thing. Arbitrary list ranking 5 to 10 to even 20 of your favorite things from the year that was. So I thought it might be fun if I, Kate Joel, delivered to you, the fans, the first annual Rack Attack Top 10 Best Comics of 2015. So without further ado, let's hop right on into it, shall we? Kicking off the list at the number 10 spot, we have Batman and Robin Eternal. Now, I was apprehensive about putting this one on the list for a couple reasons. For one, it's a newer book to make the cut, and I also kind of felt that because it was a weekly series, it could go to hell at any minute. But 11 issues in at the time of this recording, and I gotta say, Batman and Robin Eternal might be one of the best Bat Family stories in recent memory. The story is with Batman still affected by amnesia and the events of Endgame, it's up to his many sidekicks, including Dick Grayson, Bluebird, Red Hood, and Red Robin, to fight the threat of a new villain called Mother. Mother is a human trafficker who specializes in artificially created humans, perfect life forms who live to serve one purpose and one purpose only. Batman and Robin had fought the woman in the early days of their career, but it didn't end well for them. Now the team isn't sure who they can trust, as anyone, anywhere could be another Mother creation. This series has also seen the return of fan favorites like Cassie Kane and even Azrael John Paul Valley. Eternal is a cool book that allows the sidekicks to grow and mature in ways that they really haven't been allowed to since the beginnings of the New 52, and that makes me very, very happy as a long-time reader. Grabbing the number 9 spot, we have X-Men Years of Future Past. 2015 has been an amazing year for writer Marguerite Bennett, and it was super difficult for me to choose just one of her projects. Bombshells was another in a long line of absolutely killer DC digital titles that managed to feel both fresh and classic at the same time. A-Force was another cool book, cool enough that it's getting its own ongoing series. But in Instead, I wanted to use this slot to highlight a book I feel some of you out there overlooked, and that is the Secret Wars tie-in Years of Future Past. Don't worry about the event, you don't need to know anything about it to enjoy the story. In truth, this series is kind of a sequel to the classic X-Men story, Days of Future Past. We meet up with the daughter of Kitty Pride, a young girl with metal morphing powers who has been chosen as the mutant messiah, the one who will lead them out of camps and back to their former glory. Too bad she has to contend with the machinations of enemies enemies both old and new. The real power of this story comes in her relationship with another mutant named Cameron. At first they seem like the mutant Adam and Eve, then things change, then they quickly change again, and you know what, I don't want to spoil it, but my jaw hit the floor and stayed there until the very end. All the classic X-Men iconography you love is right here in the story. You got Sentinels, you got Senator Kelly, you got Locke, even freaking Destiny, that character who was in the original Days of Future Past but often gets left out of retellings of the story, is here too. Years of Future Past just isn't a great tie-in book, not just a great spiritual sequel, but probably one of the very best and most thought-provoking X-Men books I've read in a very long time. Shooting on in at the number 8 spot, we have Green Arrow. As I've stated up and down to anybody who will listen, Green Arrow is my favorite comic hero, and after the Arrow TV show writers took the range of the book, I feared that it might never be great again. But along came Benjamin Percy, and before I knew it, the book was not only back on my pull list, but one of my most hotly anticipated every month. Under Percy and company, Green Arrow got a lot of stuff back that he lost. For one, his sister Imiko, who you'll all remember from the excellent Jeff Lemire run, and for another, his liberal politics. This is a Green Arrow who just doesn't fight the bad guys, he fights social injustice in all of its forms. Patrick Zircher's art is also on point, and the new cast of original villains have all been super interesting and compelling so far. My Emerald Archer is back on top, and that is damn good news for everyone. The number 7 spot gets claimed by The Secret Six. Oh, would you looky here, Joel picked a Gail Simone book. Big shocker, I know. But even if I wasn't the biggest Secret Six mark in the world, I still probably would have put this one on my list. The new team of D-list villains finds themselves tossed together by necessity after their lives become threatened by a shadowy villain who has an invested interest in their past. And that's all just the jumping off point. This really is a book about flawed, broken people who prove they can still be super awesome and kick a ton of ass. The team itself is a nice mix of old and new Simone creations. Her ventriloquist, even the mute Talon Strix, who manages to be both the team's heart and secret weapon in equal ounces. The book is also really funny and super quotable. Weird 
couch sex anybody, throw in some stunning callbacks to reward longtime fans of the Secret Six like myself, as well as the return of a much beloved old 52 staple, and you have yourself a great superhero read. My number six favorite comic for 2015 was Nailbiter. 2015 shall go down in history as the year Joel finally attended the horror party known as Nailbiter. For the uninitiated, Nailbiter is the story of Buckaroo, a small American town that has given birth to more serial killers than anywhere else. In fact, most people in the town are related to serial killers, either by blood or in blood, if you catch my drift. Why is this? Well, that's the mystery surrounding the town. It's what keeps you interested, but the real draw are the characters, like the nail biter himself, Edward Charles Warren, a student of the Hannibal School of being a serial killer who, while pure evil one second, is kind to charming the next. If this doesn't have you sold already, the comic has some serious chops. Comic writer Brian Michael Bendis even shows up in an issue, and the series has already crossed over with another favorite of mine, Hack Slash. So if you love yourself some horror, then this one is a must read. Blasting on in at the number five spot, we have Thor. God of Thunder has undergone a bunch of changes under Jason Aaron. The realms have all really been fleshed out, and in 2015, we saw Mjolnir change hands. A lot of the new run was built around the mystery of who this newest Thor could possibly be, and what that meant for Asgard as well as Earth. Well, hey, huge spoiler alert, so back out if you don't want this to spoil you, although chances are you probably know by now. We eventually discovered that the new Thor was the cancer-stricken Jane Foster, who, alongside being Earth's representative on Asgard, Asgard's council also is forced to battle evil as the new Thor. But when our hero gets branded a traitor by the vengeful Odin, Jane is forced to keep her identity a secret from both friend and foe alike. Jason Aaron really has been writing an epic with this run, and I must say since Marvel now, there has not been a bad issue in the bunch. There sure wasn't in 2015, and I sure hope this trend continues into 2016 and beyond. Hey, he may be small, but it didn't stop Ant-Man from claiming the number four spot on this list. Nick Spencer is, in my mind, one of the fastest growing stars in comics. He's also becoming one of my go-to guys for stories about deeply flawed hard luck heroes. This newest run reinvents the life of Scott Lang Ant-Man and makes him a real contender on the Marvel stage, while also, no pun intended, keeping his story small and personal. The first arc saw the return of Darren Cross, the first villain Scott ever fought just in time for the new movie, and the rest of the series is filled with so many other great shout-outs to the greater history of Ant-Man just like that. That one. It's also important to note that this book is funny as hell, be it Scott trying to balance his weird life as a hero with also being a divorcee, or his new employees, ex-supervillains Grizzly and Machine Smith. Ant-Man is just a winner from start to finish. My number three favorite comic of the year belongs to Southern Bastards. A returning favorite to my 2015 best of the list year is Southern Bastards. It also just so happens to be the second of three Jason Aaron books to grace this list. But while Thor is high superhero fantasy, Bastards is Southern Fried Crime Noir, a book where heroes are never that heroic and the villains have more layers than you might think. Southern Bastards has had a very busy year filled with gun violence, God, and of course football. Lots and lots of football. One of its finest moments came not in the stories themselves, but when the writers responded to the Confederate flag issue that had been in the American news this year. After all, Southern Bastards is a book about the American South by two Southerners themselves that both celebrates the customs and traditions of that place, while also showing how dark and insane they can really get. Craw County really does feel like it could be a real place out there somewhere. A place I love to read about, but a place that I would probably think twice about ever visiting. The penultimate entry in this top 10 favorite of the year list goes to Prez. You don't see very many political satires in the world of comic books, at least not the ones put out by the big two, but Prez by far might be one of the funniest and smartest things I've ever read in my time as a comic critic. An updating of the original Prez, we find a terrible future where an American voter turnout is so low that people are allowed to vote for president by Twitter, and when a viral star lands the job as commander-in-chief, owing no favors to no big powers out there, she vows to make the world a better place. Throw in a sentient killing machine that questions its own gender identity, a cat flu worshipping cult, and the return of classic 70s Prez characters like Rickard, and even the terrifying boss Smiley, and you have yourself a recipe for a book that might very well stand the test of time. Heck, the book's only at its halfway point right now, and it's already proved to be semi-prophetic, what with D's nuts and even the David Cameron pig scandal. I would go into greater detail on those things, but I fear you should just read the book and see for yourself. 
And finally, my number one favorite comic of 2015 is, drumroll please, if, if I had a drumroll this is where I would put it in right here, da, 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 da. Kanan, the last Padawan, no wait, no, I, I changed my mind, uh, Darth Vader, no wait, I, I changed my mind again, uh, the, the Star Wars comic, the Jason Aaron one, actually no, Lando, no Chewbacca, no Leia, actually no, just, just all the Star Wars comics, all the Star Wars comics take the number one spot. Oh, okay, you got me, I'm a big indecisive cheater, who couldn't choose just one, but can you really blame me? I was sad to see the expanded Dark Horse universe of comics go after Disney bought the rights to the galaxy far, far away, but Marvel has made me a believer all over over again by throwing some of their very best writers and artists on some of the best, most recognizable characters in all of pop culture. Be it Jason Aaron for the third time on this list with his main Star Wars book that picks up after the events of A New Hope and fills in a ton of gaps while also serving up some awesome adventures and even working in stuff from the EU like Luke's childhood nickname. Then of course you have Gillen on Darth Vader who shows us the famous Sith Lord as a chess master unable to trust those around him as he hunts for ants about the fate of the sun he never even knew he had. Or even the great Greg Wiseman, one of the architects of the Star Wars Rebels cartoon series, offering up Kanan the Last Padawan, a tie-in book that not only lets us see the origins of Kanan Jars, but also fill in some very important blanks between Revenge of the Sith and A New Hope. Did I mention these three ongoing books also tend to intersect and cross over with one another? Because they totally do, and that's totally awesome. And those are just the main ongoing books. There's also been a ton of great mini-series with more to come in the new year. The future of Star Wars comics are bright. They totally managed to capture all the fun and excitement of the movies while also managing to do some great standalone stories as well, and that's why they steal the number one spot. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching my newest video. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you feel like checking out some more videos I have on offer here at Cape Jewel.